So I'm Dr. Bronnie Lennox Thompson, um, and I'm the academic lead for postgrad programs in pain and pain management at the University of Otago. I teach postgrads, um, so health professionals who usually have not heard much about fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. um, and I work as a, a, an occupational therapist for most of my clinical career. Um, with a hefty side dose of psychology, um, and I live with fibromyalgia. So, and I have had colleagues of mine look at me and say, oh, is that a thing? Mm. Uh, yes, yes, it's a thing. Um, mm. And so I, and I'm a real keen advocate for people who live with um, the health problem, whatever it is, to be, partners we collaborate in what works because when it comes to pain and fatigue and fibro fog and all that sort of stuff we're really the only people that can tell whether anything has helped or not that's absolutely clear and so for someone to look at me and say oh you don't have pain um I will step up and I will slap them because you cannot tell and there is no um, image or x-ray or blood test or anything that will tell you that I have pain mm. and that kind of flummoxes people so um, and I'm pretty vocal about that I'm pretty clear that this is my reality this is what I live with and I don't apologize for it at all um, the other thing that's kind of new for for me is I discovered last year that I have ADHD and so my lifelong challenge with mood has probably been not because I have been depressed, though that's happened from time to time. It's probably that sense of overwhelm from having a neurodivergent nervous system that doesn't function the way that people who are, what do you call it, neurotypical um, have. So, what that means for you is if I wrap it on, um, do stop me ask questions because I get on to a topic and I don't always slow down and I don't want to just info dump so this is really informal um it's personal um my personal story plus I've dipped into the latest research that I can locate um looking at some aspects of treatment a little tiny bit of um some research that looks at the similarities in terms of clinical presentation between someone who is living with fibromyalgia and someone who has um, a chronic fatigue syndrome. We just, there's a little bit of information there, um, but it seems to be more that we look alike and we have some similar symptoms than anything much more detailed than that. But I'll get to that as we go through. Okay, so without further ado, I'll sprint across and change. <laughs> so, as I say, it's, uh, it's personal. Um, so living with fibromyalgia is just part of, of my life. Now I'm just going to see whether I can actually click to use that one. Oh, it doesn't. I have to use this. So it's rearranging the room. This is the lunchroom normally. So um <laughs> okay. So for me it started with an eight. Um back when I was 21, I think, around about I and the doctor helpfully called it lumbago. And you know, I think lumbago is a really good term for it. Low back pain. Um, I also had low mood and I was really stressed at the time. I've also had chronic neck and shoulder pain and then arm and wrist pain and sacroiliac joint pain and fatigue and you know this sort of stuff, right? Um, all of this is probably familiar. Um, and yeah, now I'm post-menopausal so I still have hot flushes and night sweats and that fun one day it'll stop and so 
Hmm. This is this is not unfamiliar territory to to lots of us. The question is, um, what's causing it? What's what's going on? Um, so, like I say, it's not new. We've known about this widespread body pain since forever, but the term fibrositis was first used in 1904, and the thought was that it's um, it's an inflammation in the muscles or what, the fibres of the body. Um, but actually, we know that it's not the kind of inflammation that you normally get with, um, say, when you cut yourself and you get uh, red redness around the area that you've you've cut yourself, that sort of inflammatory thing. It's not that kind of inflammation. Um, there's possibly some other things that go on in there. In the mid-70s, and I was quite astonished at this, this was a, one of the first studies that looked at the presence of tender points. So if you poke me, I will say, ouch, and I'll probably want to slap you. That becomes a thing. Um, and they also noticed that people who had these tender points also had this poor or the sleep disturbance. And what it means is that people with fibromyalgia tend not to go into the very deep, deep sleep for as long or as deep as other people. So our sleep isn't as good a quality for some reason. Um, and then in 1990, the first kind of classification of fibromyalgia was published. And I was working in pain management at that time. And I remember the outrage the sort of fear mongering that went on, that, oh, everybody's going to get diagnosed with this problem. And there were issues around cover for ACC. This was just after the RSI OOS or OOS epidemics that they called them, um, that had created issues for ACC because they weren't clearly defined. And so some people were moved across from saying that they had ooze into this group of fibromyalgia. Now, because fibromyalgia is not directly always related to an accident as defined in our ACC Act, um, it meant that many people, especially in the early 90s, got their ACC claims um, declined. And that's a really sad thing because we're supposed to have these two systems, one that says you're on ACC, you get some stuff, and one that's our Ministry of Health funded stuff that says, you've, yeah, you haven't had an accident, but you still get some stuff, and it's about the same, and it's not. People with ACC cover get a lot more than anybody on, on a Ministry of Health um, funding, which is a real issue, as you know. Um, and then in 2011, the same college, um, published new criteria, and they really have only marginally changed how um, fibromyalgia is diagnosed in the last well, couple of years. So how do they decide to diagnose it? Well, first of all, people can get told you have all of these things or any of these things, and you might just happen to have pain that is related to say a certain set of muscles or you might have endometriosis pain but they do the investigation and they can't find endometrial growth or they might just say oh you've got temporomandibular joint dysfunction and so there's um, um, some thoughts that people that have this kind of range of disorders or these symptoms um, probably have some underlying same condition that might underpin these things. Um, having said that, we've been trying in research for years to identify what this magical common um, denominator is, and we really don't have a very clear idea about it. What I want to call it is we've got disordered sensory processing if we have fibromyalgia. Um, and as you can tell, Grumpy Cat does not want to cuddle. We want gentle touch, please. No heavy handedness. Um, and we generally don't want to have 
bright lights, lots of noise, lots of sensory input. Um, and that can be problematic because if you go into a supermarket, you're probably going to encounter lots of noise and lots of decisions and lots of bright colored labels and they're absolutely confusing. So in essence, what does it mean if you have this disordered processing, sensory processing? Well, in some people will hear it. I'm sorry, it really is all in your head, but please don't think that. It is not imaginary. It's not malingering. You're not faking. It's not something that somebody made up to make money out of you. This is a real condition, and it is part of the way our nervous system processes information. And that's the best description that I can, can give it. Um, the, we don't really know exactly how the mechanisms work. We have some ideas. I will talk a little bit about those. But what I really want to emphasize is that although a lot of health professionals don't understand fibromyalgia, um, in fact, we do have quite a lot of uh, research evidence around fibromyalgia. It's been a, a diagnosable um, thing for a long time now um, and so it's to, for somebody to suggest that it's because you're a woman and there's no cure for that as my daughter was told when she went to ED with um, really bad pelvic pain and given a paracetamol don't get me started <laughs> um, it is actually part of the way that our nervous system is approaching the amount of information that needs to um, activate a nerve before it sends information off. And so for people with fibromyalgia, we tend to have lower thresholds. So our nerves start to fire off more quickly and then they stay firing for longer. If I give you a picture of it, this is our, along the top there is our pain intensity. Along the bottom is the amount of stimulus that's um, that's appearing, the amount of input that's being put in. And for normal people, people with a normally functioning nervous system, theirs is up this line here. I hope you can see that. So it takes a certain amount of information, stimulus, to go in before the person says, ouch, that hurts, stop that. And we all have a range of um, sensitivity to, to pressure or to temperature or whatever. Um, and some of us are at the higher end and some of us are at the lower end. And there are some differences between males and females. But what's known for people with fibromyalgia is that we don't need as much stimulus before we say, ouch, that really hurts. And the, the two types of differences in pain that, that apply to people with fibromyalgia, we have hyperalgesia. So when we bump ourselves, bruise ourselves, or we're, say, trying to lift up something really heavy and the handle cuts into your hand, um, and normally it would hurt somebody, we'll say, ouch, that really hurts. So we get more pain to things that would normally hurt people. We also get pain that from input that wouldn't normally hurt people. Um, and part of the reason for bringing my cuppa in is I drink what other people call tepid or lukewarm coffee. Um, Why? Because hot coffee burns my mouth. So I'm more sensitive to temperature, hot and also cold, than other people. And that is why I drink tepid coffee. Everybody else looks at me as if I'm really weird. I'm, I am, but I'm not weird for drinking it that way. It's just that, it, to me, this tastes, this is hot. 
Mm. So this used to bother me as a kid when I was running in my bath because I lived in a household that had baths. We ran the bath in and I wouldn't want to turn the hot tap off because it was hot. I'd have to put a face cloth over the hot tap so that I had padding there so I could turn it off because it was too hot. And also had to test the water temperature um, because I, it would feel really hot to me. Um, the other thing that really I notice for me, and everybody is slightly different with their fibromyalgia experience, um, so pressure, mechanical pressure, in particular is something that I find I'm much more sensitive to. So that means if I'm sitting for a while and I've got my weight going through my butt, um, I'm likely to want to get up and move <laughs> much more often than anybody else. Mm. Yeah, And if I stay in one position, like I'm lie, I used to lie on my bed with my hand on my head like this, um, reading, and that would be my thing. Um, I can't do that for a long time because my hand gets really sore from that pressure that you put through your hand as you stretch it. So that's um, a big part of fibromyalgia. We've got a nervous system that just goes, it's like the volume's being turned up on any input that we put in. And that can even go for chemicals. So over time, my sensitivity to chili, like a good curry. My folks were in India when I was little, and so we, we used to have curry um, quite a lot. And over time, I found that my tolerance to chili has really reduced. Um, so mm. now I, you know, it's more likely a butter chicken than, than a vindaloo. Yeah. <laughs> so... Here we go. And we say, ouch. How is it diagnosed? Well, it often takes a long time. And part of this is because people who have fibromyalgia know that it moves around and it'll be there for a, you know, a, a little while and then it'll move to another spot and then it'll turn up in another spot. So when I first like I was quite young, I was in my 20s, um, I first didn't think much of it. I didn't think it was something that I needed to be terribly concerned about. And I thought it would go away, but it didn't. And a lot of people with fibromyalgia say that they don't see their doctor or a physio or somebody about their pain because it's there and then it goes, it gets intense and then it fades away it moves location it moves sensation so it feels different mm -hmm. so and also because our health professionals get very little training about um, pain in general but also about fibromyalgia particularly um, they're not that aware of what to look for or how to diagnose there's no blood test, there's no x-ray, there's no um, brain scan that will show fibromyalgia. We don't have any biomarkers at all, which is kind of sad. Um, we often don't present with these specific things. We say, oh, look, I'm really sore and I just feel really tired and my sleep. I wake up in the morning and I haven't had a decent sleep and keep forgetting stuff. And the doctor sort of looks at you and often it's women with children and life and and they sort of look at you as if, well, just, you know, cut yourself some slack and have some antidepressants. Being a bit mean, but this is what I've heard um, throughout my clinical career. The symptoms overlap with lots of other problems like widespread body pain can be the same as, can feel the same as some very treatable conditions. Um, and that means that sometimes the doctors would prefer to aim for those conditions and eliminate those than, than deal with fibromyalgia. Um, and a lot of 
health professionals, not just doctors, don't want to give people this label because they're scared that that's going to make you sick. Um, my experience is that when you get the label, you think, oh, thank goodness for that. I was worried it was cancer. I had some hormone deficiency, something really serious going on. And getting the label gives us a chance to connect with other people who might also have the same problem. And that we know there's strength in knowing that you are not alone. So yes, my colleagues should realize that yes, it's a thing. And giving people this label doesn't mean you're going to become unwell and use it as your identity, which is what I've been accused of and people that I've listened to have been accused of. So who gets it? Well, uh, oddly enough, more women than men, um, all ages, and the worldwide incidence is pretty much the same. No difference between ethnicities in general. But people in your close and extended family might have any one of these other um, disorders, they seem to be part of the family. Um, and that's, we're not sure why. I keep saying that, but the problem with fibromyalgia is that it is, it's an experience that we have. We have yet to find those biological mechanisms that tell us who gets it and why they get it. Some technical talk. So if we talk about this, disordered sensory processing, we can say it's nociceptive amplification. So nociception uh, is activity in the nerves that are dedicated to protecting us from potential tissue damage. So these are nerve endings that um, respond to temperature, so either too hot or too cold, um, to chemicals like capsaicin from chili peppers, um, but acids and other types of chemicals as well, um, including the things that mosquitoes inject into you, Damn. Um, and also mechanical stimulation. So pathways from the brain that would normally turn down the amount of information that reaches um, our awareness, those pathways don't function as well for us. And our over-responsive nerves don't need as much input before they send that information off to the brain for processing. As well as that, more areas of the brain are involved in processing that information that's normally involved with that amount of stimulus. So our brains are a little bit more connected um, the, one of the systems we have is the default mode network, which are those parts of your brain that are just kind of ticking along um, when you're just daydreaming or looking out the window or listening to me. Um, and they tend to be more active in people with ADHD, people with um, fibromyalgia, and probably people with chronic fatigue syndrome as well. Again, we're not sure why. Um, but it just means that we've got more of this activity going on. Um, and that probably means that we're not um, spreading the load or we're not discriminating. Our, our nervous systems aren't discriminating quite as much um, information. I'm just going to have a look at this question in the chat. Uh, uh, Jodie, good question. I will come to that, actually. Good, good question. She was asking, can it come from being over-fatigued? And short answer, yes. Um, the question is, how did you get over fatigued? And we'll get into that in a minute. So the brain can become triggered, if you like, or the neurocircuitry that's involved in processing information from the body can get more active. Um, and we, I've called it emotional neurocircuits, but it's a bunch of networks and in the brain that um, process the meaning of things, sensations, um, make the decisions about what we do and where we do it, are associated with how we plan to achieve a goal um, and how we filter out the information that we end up processing. 
And we also have some changes in some of these neurochemicals that are used in, well, that are uh, widely used throughout their nervous system and in nervous system processing. So serotonin is um, one of the things that we use, uh, we try to boost up with depression, as is noradrenaline. And some of the inflammatory chemicals, and this is different from that inflammation that you get from a cut or a scratch, um, this is, these are neuroinflammatory chemicals. Um, we have more of these substances, including a thing called substance P, um, in the spinal cord. And our, the opioid system, our own natural um, pain relieving system, isn't as functioning, functioning as well. So what this means is that for me to get the same effect from a dose of, um, say, morphine, I need to have a much higher dose. It's almost as if my opioid system is already burdened with or is already using um, opioid. So it means that if I have surgery, then I need to let my anaesthetist and my um, the surgeon know I live with fibromyalgia, I will need more um, opioid and that should help reduce some of my pain. Having said that, it doesn't always. And we have to be careful with our opioid use because as we increase the dose, we have the same risk of all the adverse effects of using opioids. So opioids are generally not that helpful for people with fibromyalgia, um, mainly because we need a bigger dose so it's only used for those short term um, when you've got a, a cut or something that is a, um, an, an inflammatory type of pain. In other words, we've got these amplified responses to normal stuff. And one theory is that it might be due to genetic adaptations that were, use, that were useful as we evolved as humans and that we tend to be more inclined to have an inflammatory response. So we tend not to react well to medications. We tend to have more allergies to things like dust mites and pine and stuff like that. Um, and so it's thought that perhaps that's a good thing from an evolutionary perspective. It's just not great for us as humans, as individuals. But it, we help to keep the genes alive, help to keep humans rocking on in there um, because it means that we're much more likely to notice the sorts of threats to our tissues than, than other people. So what sets it off? Well, some of the things that we know, um, it's probably 50-50 genetic and environmental, and there's been a huge amount of study looking at genetics. Unfortunately, it's not like um, ankylosing spondylitis, which is an inflammatory disease, where they found one biomarker, one gene, HLB27, um, and they found that one is the one. And if you've got that, you've got a very high risk of developing ankylosing spondylitis. For people with fibromyalgia, it's not that easy. And we also think there's some there's a lot of environmental factors that will set it off. So people who have a lot of muscle muscle tension, so those of us that tend to hunch our shoulders, will probably notice that. So if we sit in one position all the time, furiously typing, or whatever, that's likely to that can be associated with this um, chance of developing fibromyalgia early childhood stressors. So I'm thinking Christchurch, and I'm thinking of all those kids that got moved around through the early years of post-earthquake, um, that they got a lot of stress through those times and the chances are high that that upheaval from school and from home, from parents that were stressed, may increase the risk of people developing this pain problem. But it also means that people who have had um, things like um, 
sexual abuse or physical trauma from being abused, um, or they've had, you know, a parent leave or die early and they've had that sort of traumatic experience that's disrupted their, their sense of safety, perhaps their nervous system can get tuned up so that it's a little bit more sensitive. Kind of makes sense. If you're a little kid, you want to know what's a threat in your environment. And if you've been in stress, then you really want to know. And so there's probably been some good reason for it, but it backfires as we get older. There's certainly some hormonal things that happen um, because it, particularly from puberty onwards, um, women are more likely to, to dis develop their problems with um, fibromyalgia. Some of those neurotransmitters are there. Cytokines are these inflammatory compounds that, that kind of roar around our nervous system. And we often have these autonomic nervous system abnormalities. So this can be things like um, exaggerated hot or cold response, difficulty with thermo regulations, like temperature regulation. Um, it can be things like Reynolds phenomenon where your fingers go white in the cold or toes. Um, it can be some of your blood pressure changes, so a little bit like POTS, uh, for those who know about POTS. Um, but it could also be tachycardia, so heart rate changes, breathing rate changes, those sorts of things can be part of the picture. Um, definitely post-traumatic pain. So if you've had an accident, you've fallen over, you've hurt your back, the pain may carry on and then spread. And we, again, we're not really sure why. We do know that if we are the kind of person who's had these weird things going on all our lives, that we tend to want to watch what's going on in our bodies. And so some... Um, Therapists and clinicians will say, well, maybe you're just really aware of what's going on in, in your body. There's a little bit of truth in that, um, but it shouldn't be seen as a put down or a suggestion that if you just stopped being bothered by your body, that you'll be right. That's not going to help. Um, but it's likely that you've got more attention and more awareness of what's happening in your body because we get these weird symptoms, right? We're going to track that. Um, and also this idea of thinking the worst. When you start to think of the worst, that can set the stress response up and that, that adds on top of the challenges that we already have from, from things like fibromyalgia. Let's buzz on to the treatments. I'm just trying to keep my eye on the time. There's not a lot of options to re reduce the track the pain, um, none of these things are helpful. And in fact, if you've been put on these and you've not noticed any change to your pain, one of the things that we do a lot at the Burwood Pain Management Centre is spend a lot of time taking people off things that don't help. So for something like paracetamol, you can just stop it and, and see, did that make a difference or not? If you're on an anti-inflammatory and it's just for your fibromyalgia, you can stop that and ask yourself, did it make a difference? Sometimes going back on it means you find, oh yeah, actually it did. Don't stop things like opioids or other medications that you uh, prescribe that have a longer, they need to be tapered. Don't stop those abruptly and always talk to your health professional before you do that but we do spend um, if it's not doing you any good something like paracetamol is really making your liver and kidneys work harder than it needs to and you know you don't need to take those if they don't have any effect and you're the only one that can tell if these medications do anything for you you're also the only person that can tell whether you want to put up with the side effects because all pharmacological approaches have got side effects. That's the truth. So it's a disorder of our central nervous system. So that's the brain and the spinal cord. So the medications that we use can't just work on the peripheral nervous system. They have to be things that work on the central nervous system. And that means the side effects generally are things like feeling drowsy, 
getting constipated, um, probably a bit of dry mouth, often nausea, those sorts of um, things. So we need to make sure that when you're taking them that you're aware of that. There are also drugs that you have to take a long time. Um, they're going to be things, because fibromyalgia doesn't just disappear, they're something that you'd need to say, well, I'm going to take this for the rest of my life. Um, so if there's an unpleasant side effect or it's not doing you any good, that's why we say you judge whether it's doing you any good or not. I have not personally had any success at all with medication. And I worked at Burwood for about 15 years um, and worked close. I teach this stuff and I have not found a thing in it. What I have looked at, this paper here was published last year. These are the only medications that seem to have any kind of effectiveness. We don't have duloxetine, milnasopran or perlindol available in New Zealand. These are not available. Um, probably not worth bringing them in to be quite honest, because they don't really change pain terribly much. Pregabalin and gabapentin belong in the same group of drugs, and some people find they're amazing. Um, what they do is they regulate the little calcium channels that um, are between each of your nerves, and these calcium channels open and close to allow those, those um neurochemicals to pass through and so this helps to make sure that those um, calcium channels don't open too quickly or too often. Um, they've all got side effects. Amitriptyline and nortriptyline are both really old antidepressants and they're still the only two probably worth trying for fibromyalgia. And the best studies actually combine nortriptyline with pregabalin or gabapentin together because nortriptyline and amitriptyline both work to put some more of the serotonin available in between your, um, the ends of your nerves. And so they regulate the transmission of those, those um, nerve signals. Um, they are... Well, nortriptyline, I gained weight almost instantly. I swear I just looked at the things and I gained weight. So I don't take that. Um, amitriptyline has got more side effects. And so normally at Gerwood, we would start somebody on nortriptyline out of preference. And the thing with these is that we don't know who is going to be a good metabolizer and who's not. So we have to take blood tests and a lot of doctors are unaware of this. Um, you need to get to a therapeutic level in your blood serum for these to be given a decent trial. So the way that we go about it at Burwood is we build the dose up to either you say, I cannot stand these side effects, just stop it already. Or you say, hey, this is working really nicely or you have the sufficient amount in your bloodstream and it hasn't made a difference, in which case we'd stop it. So it's not a lot of help really for, um, from a medications perspective. There is a lot of research looking at nutritional supplements. Um, and so I looked at these two. Um, they're mainly antioxidants. Um, this one, looking at the nutritional approaches, said really Q10 or CoQ10 at 300 milligrams a day, um, administered for a long time. Like we're talking at least three months and then saying, well, maybe that, will, that has an effect. These other um, vitamins may help, but the dosing is not very clear and the quality of the studies is not very great. So it's kind of a make sure that you see somebody who is prescribing um, a quality product. We don't have regulation in our um, vitamins and minerals in New Zealand. And so what that means is you may not get 
what is on the label. So um, if anybody's been involved with J Professor Julia Rutledge's work, she's at Canterbury University and she's been looking at supplementation um, and she recommends some particular brands. And so I would be going to someone like her or to a, um, a well-qualified naturopath who can prescribe um, these sorts of things. The effect is subtle. It's not um, a huge effect. And I think that's going to be the case for most of the kinds of approaches for pain. Well, in the question, someone's asked about LDN. Um, no yeah, it's... It's only starting to come through in the literature for fibromyalgia. Um, it's really an off-label prescription. And so you'll need to see somebody who's prepared to prescribe it off-label. Um, probably a pain physician would be the right person um, because pain doctors, pain specialists, specialise in pain, just like you have a rheumatologist specialising in rheumatology, and you have an orthopaedic surgeon specialising in orthopaedic surgery, we have pain specialists who train as doctors, and then they train as a specialist, often anaesthetic, um, they might be an anaesthetist, it's a hard one to say. Um, and then they do this further specialty as pain specialists. So in Christchurch, we don't have very many, um, but we do have Dr. Chris Rumble um, and Dr. Karen Joseph. Karen is um, also a gynecologist and she's a pain, a pelvic pain specialist. And, and is, both of them are fantastic. However, they are expensive. They are medical practitioners um, who've gone through a lot of training, so they're quite expensive. You can try to get referred through to Burwood, but they, they at the moment have a shortage of pain specialists. Um, so we really have trouble getting um, good prescribing. Some of the musculoskeletal doctors may want to um, prescribe, but maybe not. It, it depends entirely on their orientation. We have found right. some GPs will support it if, yeah. if, you know, some research is provided and it's treated as a case study, you know, with the individual person. Yeah. And that's what yeah. I think all medications for chronic pain and particularly for fibromyalgia, you're the experiment, you're the guinea pig. You need to, to try it and see what you think because we don't have good randomised controlled trials. Um, probably because the mechanisms aren't very clear yet. So what the mainstay is, this is non-pharmacological, um, and I'm a real fan of non-medication-based approaches because nobody can change the prescribing rules on you. They're not expensive. You can start and stop these strategies whenever you like, um, and the side effects are okay. The things you can choose to do or not to do. So movement is fabulous. It's just really hard to do when you when you're sore. You have sweet fa just motivation to move. I know. I do not like the gym. I will not go. Um, so when they describe so exercise, the the challenge for exercise is that if you go to any healthcare professional who hasn't learned about fibromyalgia, they'll usually start us on high intensity, far more than we can manage. That is just dumb. We'll just get, you know, delayed onset muscle soreness that goes on for two weeks, not two days. Um, and I don't know about you, but I don't like that. <laughs> so it's really important to start with something at a level that you know that you can manage and just nudge into what I call the orange zone. If you stay in the green zone where you're just kind of pit, pitching along at what you can manage today, you'll never increase what you can do. But if you blow your budget and you push into the red zone, you will hurt and you will hate yourself and everybody else around you. Um, so don't do that. Be kind. Um, but just nudging into it is... It, you can't really set ahead of time how much 
movement is a nudge. It'll depend on you and your body and stuff. So what they found was that all exercise, all types of exercises, improved pain. Not a lot. 20 to 21 on the point. So that's actually a tiny amount. So that's about one point on a 0 to 100 scale. Tiny. But we don't have options outside of this. And the side effect of doing the movement practices, whatever kind suits you, is that they get us out and we can do stuff that we need to do during the day. So mind-body stuff is your Tai Chi, your Qigong, those sorts of flowing type things. Strengthening exercises can be weights, if you fancy, or you can use your own body weight to do movements. So that can be things like sit to stand, where you're exercising your lower limbs by putting your weight through your lower limbs. Um, same with your arms, you can be pushing down on a chair and using your own body weight to strengthen your arms. Um, and that's particularly helpful for fatigue. Um, aerobic is where you get huffy puffy and strengthening exercises both um, help with sleep, but again, small effect sizes, so not huge changes. Puffy puffy, I prefer to walk. Um, I do not run. This is a non-exercise person talking. Um, but I don't mind wallowing around in the pool. And so when they talk about balneotherapy, that's hot water therapy. Jumping into the water and um, you know, jumping into a spa and floofing about is fine. And if you can get to the point where you can manage actual swimming, that's great too. The cool thing about move, movement in water is that it's you get resistance in all uh -huh. directions. So aqua size is a really good um, approach, and you're not putting, you're not getting that jarring kind of effect. Not so good things are your stink of chlorine and your swimsuits or t-shirts and shorts or whatever will decay and fall apart because of the chlorine. And you have to put up with other people. I don't like that. Um, psychological treatments. Now, I don't call them these. They're just really things like understanding what your pain is about, um, managing your stress, looking at ways not to get rid of stress, but to deal with stress effectively. Things like doing deep relaxation. Everybody does mindfulness, but mindfulness is really about managing your attention. And we know that, that even in, with short practice, this changes the way that your brain processes that, um, that sensory information. So I personally use mindfulness a lot. Um, but it doesn't tend to help with fatigue. I haven't found anything much that really helps with fatigue except for doing the movement practices. Um, and so what you really want to do is find sort of the area of your fibro that's bothering you and apply a therapy that works for that. So if you're feeling like um, your strength is pretty low put some strengthening exercise or movement practices in um, I garden a lot that's my exercise um, I dance I walk the dog um, that's pretty much my repertoire just to show you these are the types of exercise things and the effect size which is on the left hand side there is really little so they really don't show you a lot of change on pain. Doesn't mean don't do it, but it just means you're probably not going to find a magic cure. So what do I do? Um, yeah, exercise is, and I like walking. Walking's good. Walking's something you don't need any equipment for. Um, and I can I can do it around the shopping mall. It's great fun. Um, I can walk the dog, I can do it. Um, getting up, I'm in the hospital today, walking around the corridors here. 
in Christchurch Hospital. So walking, going up and down stairs, um, my household activities, making my bed, um, hanging my washing out. If you think of each time you're hanging something up as I am now exercising my arms, that is exercise. That is a movement practice. Um, what we know about exercise is that it's not that any particular form of exercise is better than any other. It's that you find something or some things that you like to do because you'll do them. Um, I like variety, so I like to pick up different activities that I'll do during um, for each day because I get bored. Um, TikTok dances. Learn a TikTok dance. Do it. Do it. Do it. It's great fun um, because you can get up for a three-minute jiggle to some music and that is an exercise snack. And you can do that quite often through the day. Um, even if it's not exercise is not your favorite thing. And exercise is a bit of a dirty word for me. I'd rather say movement practices. Um, and this cognitive behavioral approach, which is where I'm kind of getting my head around setting boundaries on what I expect from myself. Um, I know that if I push myself to get stuff done, I'm going to need recovery time. Now, it's okay. You'll find people that say, don't. You must always pace your life. Um, I don't know any normal person who doesn't boom and bust from time to time. We've got special events like Christmas or a kid's birthday or you know something like that. And as long as we know that's what we're doing and we plan recovery time and we're okay with that, there's no law that says thou shalt never boom and bust. But you'll probably not be able to gradually build your strength capacity up if you do this erratic ups and downsies. Um, so, for example, I did a three-day walk around Banks Peninsula, which was a big ask. I'm, I don't do exercise much. Um, so what I had to do was I spent two months beforehand just increasing my walking amount each day. And same afterwards, I reduced, I gradually reduced because what I find is if I stop or I start or I do something unusual, that's when my body gets cranky and starts to tell me I'm sore. So this thinking approach is kind of knowing what sets you off, what settles you down, planning around it, um, setting some goals around that and being We'll all foul up from time to time. Um, being okay with saying, oh, bugger, I did it. I did it wrong. I really need some time out to recover. Or saying to people, I need a hand with this. I can't do this by myself. Um, those have been the most humbling parts of living with this problem um, because I can't do some stuff. And, you know, superwoman can do anything um, until I can't. I think particularly for men who have chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia and fibromyalgia, it's harder. Women, we're a little bit easier to fake it in some respects. We can just let some things slide a little bit, but we put lots of expectations on ourselves. Blokes tend to have lots of expectations placed on them and they find it harder to say no to stuff because bloke, real, real blokes, mate, they do everything manly. Um, and that's difficult because we can't. So my advice with this is to think about your routines. Think about what matters in your life, what you really want in your life, and not let the pain stop you. But plan to ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it to me to do some more, knowing that if I push myself just a little nudge each day, that'll get me a little bit further along to being able to do the things that I really want to in my life? Um, because that's been the best way 
for us to do it, I think. So what's helped me, this is Miss Molly May. Um, she's my Labradoodle. She's helped me because she likes to bounce. And so we go walking a lot. Um, having important things in my life that matter really makes a difference. Um, giving up lots of things was how I started. And what I found was I was still sore and I wasn't doing anything that mattered. And so I felt doubly useless. I'm sore. Oh, and I'm not doing anything that I enjoy. What's the point? So I found some stuff that I really like to do. For me, learning is the thing. So that's one of the most important things. But I've added some other stuff in as I go through. For me, dancing and walking are really important. So dancing is not, I've done belly dance and I've done ballet and I've done Latin dance. Um, now it's jiggling to TikTok videos. <laughs> because I can. Um, a balanced life. So knowing that I do some stuff, but I also give time out. Um, I need creativity. If I don't have that, I don't feel like I'm me. Um, laughs, lots of those. Um, I need my cuddles, my intimacy, whether that is because um, I have a partner, um, he has ankylosing spondylitis, so we can be sore together, except that he found a treatment that works and he has no pain, which really annoys me. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be sex. It's, it's that intimacy of knowing that somebody cares and that I can talk to and I can lean on and um, be accepted as I am. And I love my work. I love the things that I do in my job um, because I keep learning about pain. And my passion is get, getting people, health professionals, informed so that people with pain don't get the kind of um, dismissing, dismissive attitudes that I hear from the patients that I've treated in, over my career. And lots of recreation, relaxation. So photography and going out to wild places, really important things. Getting a decent night's sleep has been foundation for me, and that's taken a long time to learn. Um, and stretching and not staying in one position too long is you know, something else that I need to do with this mindfulness and acceptance. So the acceptance really is saying, yeah, I'm willing to have this pain and do things anyway. The challenge for all of us with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome is that often the amount that we can manage is so much smaller than we want. And the frustration that comes from that, along with the lack of consideration from other people, makes that the hardest part. Um, and so now I'm just kind of saying, well, this is me. Take me as I am or don't. I I'm not wasting time on you if you don't want to be part of my life and, and accept me the way I am. And I'm just going to finish with this one. I'm really happy to take um, questions, but I may have gone on for too long. I'm sorry. I'll do that. Well, um, we can stay on for a little bit longer if you can. Yeah, I can, definitely, sure. Thank you. Um, there was oh, a question. Earlier. Um, Let me have a look, see. Uh, oh, um, Corinne was asking about sleep stages. Um, I don't have the, the paper on me. It's quite an old paper, but it's been replicated. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the, I don't have one off the top of my head, um, but it's certainly a thing that we just don't get that really deep, deep sleep. The reason we need deep sleep, that delta sleep, that's the sleep that when you get woken up in the middle of a really deep sleep, you don't know who you are, where you are, what you, what you are doing. You don't remember your dream, you know nothing. It's kind of, who am I? Um, that's, that's that deep, deep sleep. So we tend to sleep a little bit more lightly than that. And our dream sleep can be a little bit more patchy. 
We need the deep sleep because that's the point at which our um, the brain is, is basically cleaning itself. It's washing out the waste products from the kinds of thoughts, um, the kinds of work that your brain's had to do through the day. Um, so it's thought to be a really important thing. Um, the dreaming sleep is how we assemble our memories and our experiences and try to make sense of those as thought. So that's why we, we kind of need to have the deeper sleep. Um, vitamin B12, yeah. Um, vitamin B, I'm not sure what rhodiola is, but um, B12, I mean, it, really having a good a good diet is really important. Try vitamin supplements and see what happens because the the ones that have been shown were the ones that are shown in that um, in that slide, and it looks like the dose is important, but also how long you take it for. You don't get a quick change. Um, but like magnesium, so magnesium and uh, quinine are both quite good for cramps and some of us can have um, restless leg syndrome or we can have periodic limb movement disorder of sleep which is what I have so all night long much to my partner's disgust I'm twitching my legs and my body um, I'm not aware of it apparently I also snore but I wouldn't do that um um, tingling pins and needles, there is not, there well, it sort of is, you may be able to consider capsaicin cream. So capsaicin cream is a cream that's made from the chemical that goes into chili. Um, it needs to be prescribed and it has to be put on the area. It can feel quite hot and um, burny to put it on. Um, and what it seems to do is it changes the substance P, which is that inflammatory substance, and it seems to confuse the nerve endings as a result. So it kind of interferes in that way. So sometimes it, um, it can be helpful for that tingling thing. I have not found it very helpful. What I, what I feel it feels like to me is like I've put on one of those those gloves, but it's all my feet and it covers my toe because I get it on my feet. It's like putting on a glove um, where the, the toes are all have little individual toe places, like fingers. <laughs> I can't describe it. Um, but, but that's what I, I, I imagine that, that, that it's like. And so that's helped me feel like it's a bit more tolerable. It's not that I like it, but it, it does make it feel less worrying. Um, let's bother some. Ah, Brittany asks, do I know how to differentiate between fibro? No. Um, the, the hallmarks for fibromyalgia are widespread body pain. And that means you've got pain in all four quadrants of your body that's been there for three months or longer. Um, and that's really the hallmark. It used to be, and we'll poke you, and, and if we can find 11 of these 18 trigger points, then that becomes your diagnostic criteria. But then they realized that we're not very accurate at how hard we poke people, um, particularly as healthcare professionals, so that's being ditched. So usually when somebody's getting a diagnosis, they'll have a blood, blood test and probably urine test um, to what they're looking for are inflammatory markers. So to see whether perhaps you've got um, rheumatic myalgia or myalgia, yeah. yeah, it's an inflammatory type of, um, of arthritis that can be treated with prednisone. If you've got that, it's wonderful because you get a treatment and it works and you don't have pain anymore, which is so cool and groovy and I'm just so jealous. Um, they'll also look for uh, the other things like uh, is there a thyroid problem? Um, is that why you're feeling so tired and lethargic? And so they're really looking for things that you don't have when they do a blood test. Otherwise, the, the test now is there's a questionnaire called the Fibromyalgia Impact Questionnaire R for revised. And that's freely available on the internet. 
um, and you can download it, and I would recommend that you do. I think it's on Health Navigator um, website. And what you can do is you can fill that out, and that will say how much your fibromyalgia symptoms are bothering you. Um, so it's a really good way of tracking, because we've got really bad memories, what your symptoms are like as you try new treatments. So it's, if a doctor says, oh, look, we'll try you on, say, um, a low dose of gabapentin and some nortriptyline, and you don't know whether that's going to do you any good, then completing the FIC R, or the FIQR, will, and you do that maybe once a week for a few weeks, that will tell you whether your symptoms actually are changing or whether it's just wishful thinking. Um, because, you know, we often have that beginning phase where we start something new and we hope that it helps in every little change that we get think, makes us think yeah I'm getting better and you think oh bugger actually I'm not I've been through that <laughs> um, so the main distinction between people with um, ME CFS is that pain is, is not generally the hallmark the fatigue is um, the, the foggy thinking, the difficulty with remembering um, are similar across both problems. But um, in fibromyalgia, the, those areas of pain have to be present. And it, you can actually get it, um, it can be called chronic primary pain as well. That's another group that it can be called. That's a different classification system. That's another way that it can be classified. And some people will describe it as nociplastic pain because that's the group of pains that, that fibromyalgia falls into. A question from Katie. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm just looking at Katie's one here. Um, so central sensitization is a term that we are um, we need to be very clear about. Central sensitization is a normal process. So when you get um, a broken leg, your spinal cord gets sensitized. And what that means is that more information turns up. It also can happen with a neuro with when you have a neuropathic pain and the nerves start to fire off and the processes that are involved in processing that get excited. And Fibromyalgia, it's not quite the same process. The thing with normal central, central sensitization is that if as soon as your or as your fracture heals, that sensitization drops off. Um, in neuropathic pain, if you no longer have that neuro, neuropathy bothering you, then that central sensitization drops off. And that's really useful, but for some of us, those increases in activity hang about. And so we're now describing that as a feature of nociplastic pain. So in nociplastic pain, it just means that your nervous system has got its knickers in a knot. That's my way of describing it. Um, not just the nervous system, but, you know, your brain, your... Um, those peripheral factors like, um, like inflammation, that's a neuro, neurological inflammation can get, um, can get to play around. So you can um, downregulate using your mindfulness, using your um, relaxation techniques, but with fatigue, um, and it's slightly different for CFS fatigue compared with, say, um, uh, post-concussion fatigue. In both cases, you need to treat that fatigue with respect um, because it's saying, actually, you probably need some rest. But it needs to be quality rest, um, not just blogging and doom scrolling because doom scrolling on your phone ain't good for you 
Um, and then the other, um, with, with both concussion, you just need to rest and let the brain heal. In, in a sense, that's what we're doing with, with fibromyalgia fatigue, um, but it's more, and probably with chronic fatigue syndrome, we just want to nudge into, like I mean nudge into. So when I started um, getting active with my fibro, I started by doing a walking program. And I walk to, out for five minutes and then back for five minutes. And most physios would look at you as if you're nuts doing that. That was what I could handle. And then I nudged into it and I did seven minutes. It was too much. I need to do six. So you only go out for six and back for six. That equals 12 minutes. So you've added two more minutes on. So that's the kind of nudge that I'm talking about. It's a little bit, so much that you feel like you've done a little bit of work, but not because, because our pain and fatigue doesn't kick in until the next day, usually, or the day after, and then it hangs around. It's harder for us to decide. So that's why I recommend you use a, a tracker on your phone, you know, a step uh, or a Fitbit or something like that to track how long you've gone for. Um, you could do how many steps, you can go how, how many minutes, but just be aware that if you're doing minutes that go up a hill, that counts as double. Um, and if you're in the pool, walking in the pool because of the resistance of the water, that counts as double. So it's the, the amount of intensity. Um, I actually think the pool exercise is really one of the best ways for us to start um, because you've got that resistance and it gives you resistance in all your planes but yet you're still buoyant um, and if you can get some pool noodles and you can relax on the pool noodles that can really help you just kind of float and bliss out for a wee bit which which we often don't get to do um, I noticed that that um, fit is the is the fit full one and we want the FIC R so F-I-Q dash R um, and just go to Google Scholar and type in F-I-Q dash R um, and then PDF and it'll probably come up. This, this we can one. share it with the, the resources we share afterwards too. So, Because um, one of the things that we're learning about things like inflammation, I'm just reminded of this um, with your question there, Katie, was um, we've learned that having inflammation is not such a bad thing. So um, was it last year? Yeah, beginning of last year, we a big study showed that if people took anti-inflammatories or inflammatories, like sprain their ankle, well, actually, they were all looking at back pain. They hurt their back and then they took anti-inflammatories. What they found was that those people who'd taken anti-inflammatories and didn't have the normal inflammatory response had pain for longer. And so there's some thoughts now that perhaps we need this inflammatory response. The problem with both um, CFS, ME and fibromyalgia is the type of inflammation that we have is a different type. And so there's some people that are starting to wonder, is this an autoimmune disease or problem of our immunity? Um, a bit like um, rheumatoid arthritis is, which is an autoimmune disease. At the stage they've studied rats. We are not rats. Um, so our nervous system can't be compared. There's some similarities, but the studies have not yet been taken through to look at um, humans and we might know a lot about the mechanisms um, involved but we don't know very much about treatments for these things and that's one of the hardest parts of working in the field that I do that I read these cool articles that say look we found this awesome thing I need to find it was done in rats and mice and it was done in three of them. It wasn't done in humans and it wasn't done and it hasn't produced a treatment and not certainly not something that we can use. 
um, for humans, the process takes a long time. It's not like um, getting, getting an injection, you know, a flu jab, where we're inoculating you, we're giving you an immunity. We can't do that. So it's a bit more like, um, so my partner with his ankylosing spondylitis, he uses a disease-modifying drug um, that's injectable, and he has to use that every two weeks. And that addresses his immune system. At the same time, it um, means that he now gets cold sores and he really has to watch his um, any infections. So there'll be a, the, there could well be a double-edged sword. You're welcome, Brittany. Lovely to have you with us. Yeah, any other questions people have? You're ready for a nap. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but uh, thank you so much, Ronnie, for sharing your story and, and your knowledge. Um, Absolute pleasure. This is this is important. We have to advocate for ourselves. We need a voice inside our health system, and that's why I teach. Because if I can teach health care professionals that we these strategies, these learning to live alongside these problems, actually need to get better attention more attention, much more funding, much, much, much more funding. Um, it's really hard to get research money from me because I'm not a drug. I, I can't produce a drug. I'm doing really boring old stuff. Um, and also a lot of the people that I have worked with clinically have never had, never been offered never given an explanation of what fibromyalgia is, never learned that it's okay to, to move. Um, they've never been given self-help strategies. And that's my passion is to get that out, out there. So well, we thank join you so me. much for being an advocate for people with um, fibromyalgia. And, uh, and it's a peer, health professionals talking to peers that has a lot more impact, doesn't it? Than, than yeah. Patients. Then we can bring part of my job is to get people who live with these problems to speak and to be part of our of our conversations and training, so that doctors and other health professionals get to understand what it is like to be on the receiving end of some of the really unhelpful stuff that I've heard myself. Yeah. that my daughter's had and the patients that I've worked with over the years have said, we, we have to do better. Yeah. Sorry, I'll get off that soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for your time um, today and for the lead up um, preparing and, and talking with me. Um, and yeah, we're really grateful for the session. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone.